On February 3rd, 2023, in London, the English football club, Chelsea, played a home game against a rival, Fulham. The game ended in a scoreless draw, but Fulham's fans were so excited they stayed to chant after the game. Soon, these words were in articles all over the world because, in just one month, Chelsea had spent 329 million euros on new players. More money than all the clubs in the French, Italian, German, and Spanish football league spent combined. We have a club like Chelsea. And they think they can do everything. I mean, it's an extraordinary amount of money. But it's what Chelsea's owners believed it needed to do in order to succeed in the most competitive, most popular, and richest football league in the world. The English Premier League. The English Premier League. These sums of money are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The problem is that the Premier League's clubs have grown so rich that the rest of Europe can't keep up. It's very difficult to be competitive against English clubs. It is so far ahead of all the other leagues. The gap seems to be widening. So how did the English Premier League get so rich? And how is that a problem for Europe's favorite sport? I need to start by explaining how football works in Europe. Starting in England around the 1860s, people began organizing official football clubs and playing each other. Eventually, they divided these clubs into a tiered system. The worst clubs played down in these leagues and the best up here. But clubs could move within this system. At the end of each season, the bottom two clubs in a league would be demoted to the league below a punishment called relegation, but the top clubs would be promoted up. It puts a competitive edge to everything. This is James Corbett, a senior reporter at Off the Pitch. You know, effectively, you could have a village club that might be in tier 10 of English football, and if you do the right things, you know, they could be playing in the first division within a decade. You do have those fairy tale stories. Wimbledon, sixth in the first division in their first season in the top flight. On the verge of a football fairy tale. By the mid-20th century, these five leagues in the biggest five countries had most of the best players, and therefore the best clubs. But every year, the best club from every league would play each other in a big tournament, at first called the European Cup. It was an opportunity for clubs in any country to win big. In the 1980s, clubs from 16 different country leagues reached the semifinals, and in that period, a Portuguese, Dutch, and even a Romanian club won. He saved it again! He's unbeatable, and Romanians have won the European but football was about to change, and it began in England with a tragedy. On April 15, 1989, 700 people were injured and 96 killed at a game in Sheffield, England, when poor crowd control and stadium design led to a stampede. It was the low point for English football after a disastrous decade. English stadiums were falling apart and attendance at matches was plummeting and English clubs were banned from European tournaments after a fight between fans killed 39 in 1985. Well, English football was a game in decline. You had rioting, you had hooliganism, you had racism. It was um, like an epicenter for all of society's ills. Disputes between clubs and television broadcasters resulted in none of the English top league's games airing on television during the 85 and 86 season. So many of England's best players fled to play in the other European leagues. By 1990, a few people were desperate to turn things around, specifically the owners of England's five richest and most popular clubs. Arsenal, Tottenham Hotspur, Manchester United, Everton, and Liverpool. The big clubs wanted a bigger share of broadcast revenues, centralized marketing, you know, they saw the benefit of that in US sports, and essentially they saw they saw an opportunity. In 1992, they led a group of 22 clubs to break off and form a new league called the Premier League, and they designed it to be English football's resurrection. It's a whole new world. The Premier League served as the new top league in English football. It controlled its own TV rights, which it sold for 427 million euros to a satellite TV company cash that the clubs then used to find new ways to make money and modernize the game. They renovated and built new stadiums that could fit more fans, and they started selling sponsorships and merchandise all over the world. But it was satellite TV that made the biggest difference, allowing the games to be broadcast to new audiences like in the US and Asia. 
the Premier League was able to more than double the price for its rights in 1997 and again in 2001. It is one of the great success stories in global sport. Crucially, the Premier League divided its TV revenue relatively equally between clubs, which made them more competitive. Spain, Italy, and Germany all gave more TV money to its most successful clubs, which let a few dominate year after year. By 2004, the Premier League had successfully turned English football around, becoming the wealthiest league in Europe, and some very rich people were noticing. Hey, I'm Sam Ellis, and welcome to Search Party. I'm going to really quickly say thank you to today's sponsor, Incogni. Every year, there are more and more data breaches, and it's because there are now countless data brokers out there possessing our personal information. That's our names, social security numbers, login credentials, location history, online activity. It's a lot. And they put it up for sale. The thing is, we have the right to take it all back, and Incogni will do it for us. It's been a game changer for me, and it's how you can take back control of your data. And it just takes three super easy steps. First, you create an Incogni account and tell it whose personal data you want to remove. Second, you grant Incogni the right to work on your behalf, so they'll contact the data breachers and request the removal of your personal information. And third is the best part. You can sit back, relax, and let Incogni handle any objections from data brokers, keeping you updated every step of the way. It's a good feeling knowing that someone is out there right now taking my name off these lists. And right now, Incogni is available risk-free for you for 30 days. That means you can try it out and see for yourselves. And if you're not happy with the service, you get a full refund. And there's one more added bonus. Incogni even takes care of those pesky people search sites, the ones that create detailed personal profiles on millions of Americans. You won't have to worry about your information ending up there either. So you can join me and the millions who have already entrusted their privacy to Incogni. So I want to thank Incogni for sponsoring our very first video. And you can go to incogni.com slash search party. Clicking that link will help support this channel and it gets you 60% off Incogni's annual plan. And it's risk-free. If after 30 days it's not a good fit, you get your full refund. Thanks Incogni for supporting our journalism. Now let's get back to the story. This is Roman Abramovich. He's a Russian businessman who, back in 2003, was worth almost 10 billion euros. And he wanted to buy a football club. He settled on a West London club named Chelsea, which was in deep financial trouble. He paid around 199 million euros for the club, and to relieve its debt, then immediately injected millions more of his own money to buy almost a dozen excellent players from clubs in the Premier League and across Europe. Even while the club lost money, he added more. That was the big moment because he came in and he had a level of wealth that was just beyond anything that the Premier League had ever seen before. Chelsea quickly won the Premier League in 2005 and 2006 and began consistently qualifying for and advancing deep into the all-European tournament, since renamed the Champions League. Abramovich proved that you could buy success in the Premier League, and it encouraged other owners to try it for themselves. Throughout the 2000s, a new class of wealthy and mostly foreign owners began buying and pumping millions into Premier League clubs. It helped that at first, the Premier League had very few rules on who could buy a club and how much they could spend on it. Premier League has always been sort of quite non-interventionist. Any investment is as good investment. So these new owners began making the already rich clubs richer, while others boosted some smaller clubs into notoriety. Sheikh Mansour bin Syed Al Nayan was a member of oil-rich Abu Dhabi's royal family, who in 2008 bought Manchester City. Yeah, Man City moved it up another notch because you had the resources, not just the wealth, but the resources of a nation state. He spent over 1.7 billion euros over the next 15 years on the best players, coaches, staff, and facilities from all over Europe. And of course, it worked. Aguero! Manchester City are the Premier League champions! This strategy helped spark an arms race in the 2010s. Clubs started spending more and more each year to sign the best players and keep up with each other. While many of the rich clubs could afford to lose money on expensive players, many smaller clubs couldn't. It created huge inflationary pressure, not just in terms of transfer fees, but in terms of player salaries. And they effectively pulled the rug from under the feet of other clubs. And it became harder for clubs promoted into the Premier League to afford to stay there. Clubs have massively overspent trying to get into Premier League. In 2013, the Premier League adopted rules that were designed to encourage clubs to break even. But they didn't slow down the spending because these clubs were in a lucrative cycle. As wealthy owners spent millions to bring the best players to the Premier League, more fans, especially international ones, wanted to watch it, which generated more TV money. 
which gave clubs more money to spend on more players. By 2022, the Premier League had 11 of the 20 richest football clubs in the world. And as far as revenue, the Premier League clubs brought in over 3 billion euros more than Germany and Spain's top leagues, and more than double France and Italy's. So by 2023, the Premier League was on a spending spree that Europe's other clubs just couldn't match. Something Chelsea made obvious in 2023. Transfer deadline date and Chelsea have locked down a British record transfer. Spending of $357 million in January, La Liga president has launched a scathing attack. The British market is a doped market. This can jeopardize the sustainability of European football. Do you think we're going to see a time when the Premier League's ever equal by any of the league. By 2023, Europe's other leagues generated far less television money than the Premier League. But they also had more rules. Germany blocked ultra-wealthy owners from taking over its clubs, and Spain's league placed strict spending limits on its clubs. It often made these clubs healthier financially, but put most of them at a huge disadvantage when bidding for players against Premier League clubs, like Chelsea. The year before, new ultra-rich American owners had bought Chelsea, decided to splurge on new players, and were prepared to pay huge prices in order to outbid the other Premier League clubs. It offered 121 million euros for one player from Portugal's league, and 70 million for one in Ukraine's, plus millions more for another six players, totaling 329 million euros. That's more money than the annual revenue of most European clubs. So Chelsea got these players, and while its spending was extreme, even the worst Premier League clubs were outbidding Europe's major clubs. Southampton bought five players, including one from France for 25 million euros, and Bournemouth bought three players, including one for nearly 23 million euros from Ukraine. Essentially, Premier League clubs are buying up nearly all Europe's best players, and these clubs can't afford to stop them. I know executives of what, by any measure, I would consider big clubs and say Germany. And they're very, very frustrated because Every year, they will lose their best players to an English club. Some already rich and successful clubs in Europe are trying to match the Premier League spending. But it's caused Spain's Barcelona to spiral into a debt crisis, and Italy's Juventus was caught fudging its accounting. Europe's other clubs, meanwhile, are increasingly choosing to sell their best young players to Premier League clubs, meaning it's harder than ever for them to compete. You can see it happening most clearly in the Champions League tournament. Remember back in the 80s when clubs from 16 different countries made the semifinals? In the past 10 years, it was just six. And only these six clubs have won it. Playing in a major Champions League match earns a club millions. So when it's dominated by a handful of rich teams, they get even richer. It definitely affects the competitive balance. Clubs from less significant European leagues, it is, it is gradually forced them out. This runaway wealth imbalance is why a few rich clubs, including six from the Premier League, tried to break away and form their own Super League back in 2021. An outcry by fans forced them to abandon the plans, but the problem didn't go away. We talk in terms of European Super Leagues, but the reality is the Premier League is the European Super League. And they've done it! They've done it! Manchester City have done it! The Premier League has announced that it plans to install stricter rules that limit what clubs can spend on players and it might be starting to enforce its rules better. In February 2023, the Premier League charged Manchester City with more than 100 violations of its financial rules, stretching back as far as 2009. If found guilty, it could be relegated. But restricting spending could just make permanent the advantage the rich clubs already have. It's the Premier League's past willingness to let anyone own a club harder to fix. Once you've opened yourself up to a nation state, buying into your organization, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to stop that. Manchester City complete a historic treble. And I'm not sure that it can be done. And that's the first episode of Search Party. Hope you liked it. Glad to have you here. We've got more sports stories and we've got more geopolitics stories coming this summer. But I want to know what you want to see us cover. So you can let me know in our community tab. But the most important thing you can do right now is subscribe to Search Party. And I'll see you next time.